So I'm originally from Finland. Uh, first 23 years I was born and bred there and then I moved to London where I met my husband who is British and then my work brought us here in Australia where we have been since 2008. So I live in about one hour's drive from Sydney where I'm actually going to drive today uh, down the south coast of New South Wales and I'm overlooking the sea. The sun is just coming up. It's uh, about six o'clock in the morning. The sun is just coming up. So just rubbing it in. Yeah, so this is quite distracting. So this is where I write, but I can see the ocean. And usually I have blinds down so I can see it because otherwise I would be just staring at like this and my eyes would be as big as blade and just daydreaming. My husband actually refuses to work from this office. He works upstairs so he doesn't have to look at the ocean. <laughs> well, it's all about slow living. And if you are someone who is thinking about because of the COVID thing that I, you know, need some kind of uh, inspiration how to do it differently then this book is for you okay everyone now this might seem a little interesting when you're when you're going to hear my my guest's voice when she begins to speak and when you find out where she lives now there's a story there's always a story so we're going to put a lot together for you just so you know but my guest today Susanna is here with me. Susanna has a new book. Susanna has a website. You might know her as Nordic Mum. Uh, there's so many things to talk about. Susanna, welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you so much. It's so good to have you. Congratulations on your book that's now out. Yes, on the 14th of July. Let's tell everybody about the book right off the bat. Come on. That's why we're where we're here, right? It's here. So it's oh, called... I love it. The Nordic Lifestyle, Embrace Slow Living, Cultivate Happiness and Know When to Take Off Your Shoes When You're Visiting a Nordic Home, of course. Mm -hmm. We do that in Canada too, Ruth. Oh, you know that, right? I didn't. Um, now I know. We always take off our shoes. Um, yeah. I've found some American friends, and when I go to visit them, they're like, why are you taking your shoes off? I'm like, because we do that. I don't know. I like... You don't do yeah. that? Yeah. Maybe you, maybe you guys have Nordic roots. There are lots of immigration there back in the day. So maybe it's from there. There you go. So, okay, let's just start off with that tradition right there and that bit of knowledge. Where does this go back to and why is this a thing? Um, I think it's actually a practical thing because, uh, you know, having mud, muddy, snowy shoes when you come inside in a house, there's usually this what is called a dry room where you leave your shoes before you enter the actual house. So I don't know, Japanese people and some Asian countries, you take shoes off anyway and you turn them around so you're ready to leave the house. But in the Nordics, it's just a practicality thing that, you know, and your your host will actually frown upon you if you come their shoes on. And sometimes in the summertime, you can be more flexible, but normally you take your shoes off. It's a politeness towards the host as well. So there you go. You were, I love what you just mentioned about, as you said, Japan. Like, what do they do with their shoes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they take off their shoes and they turn them around so that you're ready to just slip them back in <laughs> when you leave the house. The practical Japanese thing. We don't so do that. so amazing. But... I, never, I never even pictured that. I never realized that that's what they're doing, but that makes sense. You know, you're ready to leave. It does. You're already thinking about your departure when you just got there. That's <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's great. Okay. So, okay. So I mentioned in, in the beginning parts, I love, I love listening to you speak and I love the Nordic accent, by the way, but where are you in the world right now? So I'm originally from Finland. Uh, first 23 years I was born and bred there and then I moved to London where I met my husband who is British and then my work brought us here in Australia where we have been since 2008. So I live in about a one hour's drive from Sydney where I'm actually going to drive today uh, down the south coast of New South Wales and I'm overlooking the sea. The sun is just coming up. It's uh, about six o'clock in the morning. Oh, the sun is just coming up. <laughs> So just rubbing it in. Oh, gosh. Six o'clock in the morning. It's like four o'clock in the afternoon for me. So, wow. Thank you for starting your morning with me. That is wonderful. And you, you can see the ocean from where you are? 
Yeah, so this is quite distracting. So this is where I write, but I can see the ocean. And usually I have blinds down so I can't see it because otherwise I would be just staring at like this and my eyes would be as big as blade and just daydreaming. My husband actually refuses to work from this office. He works upstairs so he doesn't have to look at the ocean. <laughs> what a distraction that ocean is, isn't it? I know, right? first world problems. <laughs> wow. Okay, so what do you miss about home now that you're in Australia? Do you know, at the moment, I just miss to be able to go and see my family and know that they're safe and sound. I think because of the war in Ukraine, mm -hmm. it's making everything, and the pandemic, of course, it's making you think that everything is really more fragile in life. And just the smell and, and the silence and the food and the sauna, yeah, just the whole package. And I've been, you know, I haven't been in Finland for four years now. So that is the longest I've ever been wow. without visiting. Wow. Yeah, that is quite long. And the, yeah, the pandemic has changed so much for everyone, travel-wise and family-wise. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hope you get to go back soon and you get to see everybody again. That would be good. Yes. I think next year, July, is, is the plan that we're going to go. So that will be five years. Wow. That's amazing. Okay. So you, you've written a book. Why did you write a book? I would, that's a good question to start off with. Yeah, so I have a podcast called The Nordic Mum. Mm -hmm. So on that podcast, I was talking about Nordic lifestyle, the slow living, and I, was, I had guests with other Nordic people who live overseas, some who live in those Nordic countries, and talking about the culture and how to keep it alive and... I think for me, it was just kind of connecting with my Nordicness and with my culture. And then I had a podcast uh, mastermind and my um, mentor said to me, I think there's a book in your podcast. And I said, you know what? I think you're right, but I don't know how to get it out. And I was thinking and thinking what to do. Then COVID happened 2020. I was like, okay, I need to do it. And I was like, oh, I'm going to cheat. I have so many podcasts and blogs. I'm just going to put all those together. It's chapter, chapter, chapter. And I have the notes and everything else. Oh, 7,000 words. I'm rocking it. And then I realized that chapters in a book are different than a blog post. And the blog posts are written to target search engine optimization and certain keywords. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work in a book like that. And then COVID was just ramping up and I just left it. And then 2021, July, I said, okay, we have another lockdown. I have no excuses now. And I took the manuscript and I started typing away and I left maybe one or two blog posts, which were like a basis of different chapters, but everything else was just started from scratch. And I realized that I actually enjoyed creating the book, like from scratch. And I think come November last year, I spoke to another lady who was writing a book at the same time and she pointed me to this woman who is an editor because I was looking for editor, but I was also stuck and I was 24,000 words and I was like, I just can't get any more, but I know there's more. And she really helped me and she became, Chris Emery became my editor. And then February, March this year, I handed out to her and voila, July, it was published. Wow. Wow. That's great. And I love that you found help when you needed it, right? There's somebody there that could give you that that expertise. That's great. Yeah, and sometimes you need someone to kind of look at it from the outside in because you're too close to the project. You just see the things that are wrong and you're getting stressed about it. But she was really, I sent the manuscript to her and she just said, yeah, this is what I think you should do. And And she was pinpointing exactly the things that, you know, I had to fix. And yeah, and the, the book... Well, the only criticism so far, I've had five-star reviews on the plat every platform that I've looked at so far, which is good. But the only criticism that people are saying is that they wanted it to be longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. That just means part two, another one coming. Yeah, right? that's what they were saying. We're looking forward to reading the next one. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's that's a great, That I love that kind of feedback. Um, because, yeah, creating something like this, you're putting yourself out there and... You have an audience, which is great through the podcast. That's wonderful. You've kind of built up a little bit of a community around your message and around you. Um, but how mm -hmm. how is your how is your audience responding to to the book? So I use some of my e people from my email list as a 
beta readers, like advanced copy readers. And it was really good feedback. There were some who were just like loving it. And the others just said we wanted to have more personal stories, and which I kind of knew as well. But I deliberately left them out, I would say, but maybe because it's your first book and you're putting yourself vulnerable and you don't know how much to share and how much keep to yourself. But yeah, they, they were really responsive. And since I've been emailing about it and talking on social media, like Instagram and Facebook, I've certainly have seen peaks of people buying it. But it's always nice when you get feedback and those reviews when there are people who actually don't know you that well or who haven't actually been in contact with you before. Mm -hmm. And this is their first flavor of the way you write or the way you talk. And they actually say they, they like it. So it's like, well, this, I'm doing something right. So what authors inspire you as a reader? Do you know what? I did not read books like mine before, but I since have um, read a few books. For example, Helen Russell, who has a very famous book called The Living Danishly. Mm. And she was a guest in my podcast. So I've written, I've, I've read quite a few of hers. Then there is Katya Pantsar, who is a Finnish, uh, lives actually in Toronto. Mm. And uh, she has living, she has uh, written books about Sisu. Mm. And I've read those ones as well. So I, but usually, you know what? I like to live, I like to, to read biographies, historical things, yeah. historical biographies. Uh, Michelle Obama's Becoming mm -hmm. was a good one. I've, I've lots of like, you know, books about Tony Blair, about Trump, yeah. uh, love or hate him, yeah. but, you know, just about personality wise. Uh, so very different ones. But what inspires me is probably romance. Like I love to read a nice happy ending story mm -hmm. because life is, let's face it, quite miserable at times, particularly through the pandemic. So reading books where they love each other until the end is like, yeah. So is this book only released in English at this point? Yes, so I'm in the process being podcaster, narrating the audiobook, and I'm looking at writing a Finnish version, so not a translation, because some of these things won't trans translate well to another language, so Finnish. Yeah. So writing a Finnish version of the same, but that's probably next year. Could you do an audible version in Finnish, though? Yes, okay. I could. Would that, would that translate? But I will... Yeah, yeah. Okay. I I could, but I I think I want to write the 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 Finnish version of the same first before I do uh, if before I narrate it because then yeah it just wouldn't be the same. Are you, do you listen to audible books at all yourself? I haven't, but now since I start narrating, I have started listening because I'm like I need to understand. And sometimes I'm actually looking at their physical book or the book on a Kindle to see how they're narrating oh, it. That's so a smart learning tip. to narrate it. I like that. Because I have a habit of talking really fast. So I have to pace myself, mm -hmm. whether it's Finnish or English. I have to pace myself not to kind of go like, okay, yeah. next, next, next. Uh, but then you know that people are listening books and they put it, you know, faster because they want to to get through get the yeah books. the one thing yeah. i do like i I've, i listen to audible books um while i'm working because i have a job mm. where i don't really need to concentrate on the task the task is menial but i throw on an audible book and i'm learning and you know, what i love is when the when the author does a little side step and stops away steps mm. away from reading and maybe there's a new insight or uh maybe there's a story behind that you didn't really ha include in the book, but you want to share a little mm. more about, and you kind of get this little mm. bonus content in the, aud yeah, in the audible yeah. version of the book. I always thought that was kind oh. of a nice little little bonus. It felt like you're like yeah, in I the haven't, club. I haven't come across that, but that's actually, thank you for sharing that, and I have to um, include that for my book as well, because I left things out from my book, so there's things that are not there, so maybe I can incorporate those in some ways now that you said See, that. working together i love it i love it <laughs> i'm looking forward to the audible book as well that'll be really really good do you have a timeline for how long like when that might be available uh, 
I'm probably hoping in the next two months, okay. it's the recording. It doesn't actually take that much time, but it's the editing process. Yeah. And I'm probably see if I can get it professionally edited because I edit my own podcast episodes, but now I have not been recording since last October when the book really started coming together. So I could do it, but I have to see if I will be happy with the quality and if, if it passes all the, you know, the specs. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't, then I'll probably get a professional person to do it for me. Great. I love, I love listening to this. this is wonderful. So we're kind of on the topic sort of about your podcast. People are listening to this as a podcast. So let's, let's share your podcast as well. And, you know, let's people, let people know what the podcast is about. And maybe we can get you some listeners after they're done listening here. They'll, <laughs> they'll jump over there as well. So tell us a little bit about the podcast and maybe how that started. Yeah. So the Nordic mom was actually called my name first. So the first episode. So listeners, please don't go ever listen to the first episodes to any podcast because they are usually crap <laughs> because the people are writing. So I just literally just blocked in my iPhone headset um, uh, to your laptop and started recording. And then I wondered why didn't it sound as good as like someone someone else's who's been doing it for years. <laughs> so it was called My Name Susanna Hayskening. And I was talking about parenting. And then I just realized maybe a few episodes down the line that I wanted to talk about my culture and heritage. So I then asked some friends, what do you think about the name? And they said, well, the Nudic mom. So that's how I started. Um, And then I started doing the episode as a blog post as well, which people said is doubling up really like you didn't have to do that. But I maybe that's already showed the creative writing Mm -hmm. side of myself that I want to kind of incorporate that. And yeah, I used to do once a week, once every two weeks. And by the time I started writing, I was just too torn. My creative side was too torn and I just wanted to concentrate on writing. So October last year, I stopped recording. But there's about 120 episodes out there and they're still live in Shopify, um, iTunes, wherever you listen, they're always there. But um, yeah, and there's a lot of interesting guests, you know, people from the Nudics. I talk about slow living the Nudic way. What would you have to do to have your life a little bit more nudic wherever you live, which is what the book is actually about as well. Amazing. Okay. So a little tip that I heard from somebody else about podcasting, when podcasters take a break, is to even just do a short little, you know, hi, just an update for everyone. My book is now out and you can find it here. And that's it. Like two minutes. And what it does is it refreshes mm. your podcast and anybody who that subscribes will see an update from you. And it's like, whoop, right? And that's it. It's just enough to make people go, oh, I love this. Right? Now I have to write that down. So that's a good... You give me a good tips here. (laughs) Or you can bring back an older episode and re-release it again. And it just refreshes your feed. And people are like, what's going on? And Because it shows up on their phone. And they're like, I'm Mm. interested. And you just take take your episode, maybe do a new intro. You know, hey, I just want to share an episode. Episode 45. I had this guest. Really good. Oh, by the way, my book is out. Here's the episode back again. That's it. Yeah. Those are neat. And I'm quoting some of my guests who've been on my podcast. So that would be a good way to reintroducing those episodes. Beautiful. With a new intro. Beautiful. Great tip. There you go. <laughs> Let's promote that book. I love it. That's great. So I'll be listening. I'll be listening for this. So just so you know, there's somebody in Canada. Keeping their eyes and ears <laughs> open. So I'm excited. So oh, everyone go great. to, we'll have links to the podcast in the show notes. Jump over to Susanna's podcast. Give her a like, a follow, and a share, and all that great stuff. Because there's episodes coming in the future. And you want to make sure you're there. And you have lots to listen to, right? How many episodes? 120. Yeah. Over 120. Yeah, you've got lots to listen to then. So if you're listening right now, and after this, you don't know where to go next, Susanna's podcast. Definitely go over there. So we'll have links for you to go there. So that's good. So we got that out of the way. That's good, right? That's good. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so tell me a little bit more about your writing journey. I am always love this as well. Um, any tips, any suggestions for people who are considering writing a book, maybe on the process, maybe some of the things you learned, maybe about yourself even in the process? Yeah, look, I did few writing courses because I was procrastinating, thinking I'm not good enough as a writer. So I did a feature writing, so like article writing course, thinking I want to write articles in a side. 
uh, as a side in common side thing. And I had already written some articles, but I was kind of thinking like, oh no, I need some help. And this was from Australian Writers Center. And then I came across a creative writing course, which was like a six week course during COVID. And it was like giving feedback from the tutor who, who gave feedback for the that you did every week. And I found that really inspiring in a sense that someone actually looked at your writing and they liked it and they said what well, you could make it better. Um, I don't I don't think you have to do writing courses. You don't have to have a PhD in university on creative writing to write a book. And I think that's a misconception a lot of people have that you need to have a piece of paper to say yeah. that you know how to write. And I think other thing is that people say you should write every day. It's true, like prophetic writers like uh, Stephen King, who does 2,000 words every day, Christmas Day, every day. <laughs> so he's a machine and he's been doing it for 30 years. Yeah. That's different to you when you're just starting. That's a muscle, right? So, That's a muscle that he's developed. Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 And I don't think you have to write every day. It helps if you do write every day. I don't uh, measure my progress with words. So... I might do 200 words, I might do 10,000 words, but I don't measure it with, um, in terms of words. I measure it the time that I've spent writing. Is it 15 minutes, half an hour, two hours, three hours? Mm. And it's all progress. And the more you write, the more you have to edit. If you don't write anything, you don't have anything to edit. And the other thing I kind of realized that <laughs> that we have this habit of you know, looking and trying to find things perfectly and it won't be perfect the first way around. So if you just verbally vomit through your fingers or dictation and just get the you know words out there, you can go later on once you've written the draft, you know, edit it and make it better. But don't just think that it has to be perfect, that you have to get the words in the right order. Because then when you have a professional editor who goes through it, they will, you know, cut and chop and do line editing and develop more editor and whatever to make it sound better anyway. It will be your tone of voice. And that's what I was worried in the editing mm -hmm. progress, that it's going to take all the quirky Finnish jokes and, and all <laughs> sorts of other things away. But she was very conscious about that, you know, this is your first book and you actually want to keep some of these things there. So that's fine. I think going forward, I will. I have started um, new drafts, two of them actually, and I'm trying to debate which one to do first. Mm. <laughs> but um, I have been doing a few other courses since, and that's just more for me to kind of understand plotting. And this one, it will be fiction, so kind of plotting oh, the character yeah. development and all that. And and that has been interesting. So I think. As a creative person, you're always in this journey of learning new things. And and I, I love, like, we have the lifelong learning concept in Finland. You are always learning new things. And to me, it is like I thrive when I learn new things and I can implement those, whether it's my writing or podcasting or something else. And I think anybody who's listening who thinks, I want to write a book and I want to be a writer – it's a tough job. And it's kind of like you said, a muscle. Stephen King has a muscle he's developed and he's exercising it every day. And it comes to a point where you feel like, I don't really feel like writing today and I don't, I don't feel inspired. But if it becomes like a book comes a product and it becomes a business, then yes, you have to write even when you feel like you don't want to write and you don't have anything to say. Because then when you sit down, you bum and seat and you start typing away or dictating away, you actually feel like, oh, actually, I do have something to say. But like in any job in the world, we sometimes we feel like don't really want to do this mm -hmm. and you still have to go and do it yeah. because you get paid for it. Yeah. But, you know, you have, you know, you have expectations from your readers as well when you start getting more and more books out that they want to read more and more. So like I said in the beginning, they, they're already waiting for the next book. <laughs> Because this yes. one looks too thin, so where's the next one? I love it. So let's talk a little bit about in, in podcasting and writing. I'm a musician, so in, in recording music, there's this imposter syndrome that we hear people talk about where I'm not good enough, I don't have the education, I don't have the degree. Um, how much did that really impact you at the beginning of of your podcast or the book or both? 
podcast, not so because it's verbal okay. and I have a verbal diarrhea most of the times mm -hmm. and you actually have to tell me to shut up, to stop talking <laughs> most of the times. So my friend, when they heard I'm doing podcast, I was like, yes, this is a perfect thing to do because you have verbal diarrhea, so go for it. But with writing, because I suffer from dyslexia. Mm. So if listeners don't know what dyslexia is, that's where you have kind of a blindness of the word. So you're your brain is thinking about something, but the way you type it comes out completely gibbly-gook. Mm. It might not be the way you want it to mean it. And mine is auditive uh, dyslexia. It was diagnosed back in the day when I lived in Finland and I was at school and I got really good support and it didn't. It hasn't really bothered me. But in the back of my head, I was like, I can't be an author, I can't be a writer because I have dyslexia and it's going to make so much harder to write. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I um, I felt that it was holding me back and that was the procrastination. And then I listened to this um, podcast episode by by um, Joanna Penn and Creative Penn. And there was a man who was hugely successful, um, <coughs> excuse me, hugely successful um, author. I can't remember the date of my his name but I remember being in a traffic lights in the local okay, across the road from the local pub listening this and it was a green light and I didn't go because I was just listening what this man was saying that he had dyslexia he was able to write he was dictating because his uh, dyslexia was much more severe than mine and in that moment I knew that I can write the book and that was actually kind of like the kick in the bum that I needed that I can write the book and the dyslexia was just me holding myself back. It was procrastination, thinking that this thing that I have had since I was born and it's never going to go anywhere, it's going to make me not do the things that I want to do in life. So, yeah, I just ignore it. And my editor actually said she could not tell. She said there were some mistakes that were repeating themselves, but she thinks they were more like, the second language, English being a second or third language kind of thing, yeah. rather than the actual dyslexic mistakes. But my sister, who is a teacher in Finland, she said, I can see your Instagram captions or your Facebook captions. When you write them, I can still see the dyslexic mistakes there. So it's still there. But that was the thing that was, you know, making me procrastinate and hold myself back more than anything else. So, Susanna, I want just to, to highlight for you that Someone could be listening to this podcast episode at those streetlights waiting to go. You're talking <laughs> about your story now, and they are in the exact same spot or something else that's saying, you can't do this. They're listening to your voice right now. The light is green. They're not moving. But hearing you share your story could be the one thing that just sparks them to say, I can do this. So. It's like full circle moment here. It is. Right? You're right there. So that's inspirational right there. So wherever you're at in your journey of writing, just start, right? Yeah. Start from somewhere. That's where it all begins, right? And I think as we as we make those steps towards our goal, I think that's that's going to lead us to success. So I'm excited about this. Susanna, tell us a little bit more now just about now that the book is done, you're at the promotion side of it. What are you doing and, and how what are what is what's easy for promotion and what's difficult for promotion of your book? Even though when you have existing platform like your email list, your socials, and you are like known as the nudic mom, you still it's not like the book doesn't just walk off the shelves on its own. <laughs> Let's face it. So you still need to push it through your email list, your socials, but then after you kind of exhausted those avenues, then you have to look at so what else. So there's a lots of, um, uh, you know, people who are promoting books in the social media. So you can use like book talkers or book crams. So those are people who do specific, they review your book and they give feedback to their followers in either TikTok or in Instagram or even Facebook about that book. So that is one place to kind of go. The second thing there's are like a book buck, which is like platforms where you can get promotions, but you have to pay to get in yeah. them and they don't select all the books that you, you know, are suggesting. And 
if you get there, they say those are like the gold standards, you know, that's where you kind of start selling things. And then, of course, it's the advertising through Facebook and Amazon and all the other ones where you basically threw money on a black hole and you hope that something's going to grow out of it. But if you are, you know, marketing savvy, going like getting yourself covered in magazines. So specifically when you are in a niche, so I am in a niche area and I know there is Scandinavian magazines who have written about my book and I know there's a blogger who is going to blog about my book and those are unpaid. They're just because these people need content Mm -hmm. and they know that your book is about content that their uh, people would love to um, read about. And it is kind of like taunting to go there and approach magazines and say hey i wrote a book could you write about it and it's almost that you have to get that old kind of uh, rest release out and explaining why they should talk about and write about your book and what is it so exciting about it and what is so different to your book to some other books so there's a lot of things that you can do i think my local uh, bookshop does this author talks and although they're not specifically my um my my uh, kind of uh, ideal client but still going and talking to your local people and there's all these mums from the school gates and you know people that you've seen and you don't know their name but they come and listen to you talking so that's kind of going to be exciting thing to do as well but there's so much different uh, you know avenues where you can go and promote your book and you really need to sometimes just test what works for you it might be that the ads are not your thing. Maybe for you, it is going those book clubs, you know, physically and going seeing and, and promoting the book that way. Maybe it's library talks. Maybe it is those online uh, grammars and book talks that will get your book going. So it's different things, for different people in a different niche. So there's not one shoe fits yeah. them all kind of approach. Excellent. So the website, the nordicmom.com, correct? Yeah. Um, and there we can find all your links to your social media, everything. We can check out the yeah. podcast, the book as well, the blog, so much stuff. Yeah. I have it up on the I screen know. here as we're chatting. So <laughs> it's great. I'm checking out your website as well. So, um, yeah. So any, any last words for people that are listening to the podcast, um, about the book and maybe why this book should be on their shelf? Well, it's all about slow living. And if you are someone who is thinking about because of the COVID thing that I, you know, need some kind of uh, inspiration how to do it differently, then this book is for you. Now, in my website, I actually sell the soft copy myself. So I don't pack it and send it out, but you can buy it from the soft copy from there and the ebook as well. So this is the way you support author journeys of those who have just started when you buy them from directly Mm. rather than the big publishing houses like Amazon, Booktopia, whatever is big in your place. So yeah, go and nudicbum.com forward slash book is where you find all that. Beautiful. We'll put all that information in the show notes. Thank you so much for your time and for starting your day with with us. The sun, is it up yet? (laughs) It is. Oh. It's a little bit cloudy, but it, I can see the boats. I can see the sea. Oh, gosh. Yes, it looks pretty good day today. <laughs> well, it's on my list. I'm going to have to come there someday and, and experience that. So thank you so much for time today and starting you, your David. day with us. I really appreciate that so much. Everyone, please go support Susanna and all of the great things she's doing. Go buy the book. Listen to the podcast. Right? <laughs> thank right? you, David. Excellent. Yes, yes, thank yes. you so much. <laughs> Hey guys, thank you for listening to the podcast. Jump over to livingthenextchapter.com, our website, and you will see a spot where you can leave a voice message. We'd love to hear your feedback. We're trying to make it as easy as possible to hear from you. So if you want your voice on this podcast, yes, that's possible. Go to livingthenextchapter.com, click the little icon, little microphone icon, leave a voice message. We'll insert your message into the podcast. Tell us where you're listening from. Uh, Tell us your favorite guest. Maybe there's a guest we should have on the podcast. Maybe you should be our next guest. Leave us a message. Livingthenextchapter.com Again, thank you so much for listening. Please share this podcast episode with one person. That's all we're asking. 
Meet you over there at livingthenextchapter.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. Love to hear from you. Till the next episode. It's coming up right away. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Thank you for being part of Living the Next Chapter. Thank you for supporting our guests. Great day.